Thank you so much for having me today. It's, uh, it's a real delight uh, to talk about uh, this work, which, um, uh, you know, Rishi um, referred to my uh, sort of interests in, in beyond astronomical physics and astroparticle physics. This is kind of a, a slightly, a slightly uh, different direction in some sense. Um, uh, so we've been quite interested in, in the physics of black holes, specifically the physics of small black holes that might be related to the dark matter. Um, and as, you know, as we thought about uh, interesting things that could happen around black holes, we were reminded of um, an interesting fact, which is that, you know, black holes are really small objects. Uh, so in a recent paper, we evaluated, for instance, the wave effects that are involved in the microlensing of black holes with a mass smaller than the Earth mass. Uh, so let's say asteroid mass black holes. This, you know, were thought to be uh, possibly dark matter candidates. Uh, but then there was a, a very interesting paper uh, that used the HSC Subaru hyperprime uh, hyper camera. And, uh, you know, they used microlensing events of these black holes transiting in front of stars. And we realized that they were using light whose wavelength was actually comparable to the Schwarzschild radius of the black holes. Uh, and so, you know, from, from classical optics, we, we know that there are wave effects, there's diffraction, right? When, when you're trying to observe something uh, with the light whose wavelength is the same order of magnitude as the object that you're interested in observing. Uh, so, you know, the bottom line of our study was that the constraints on, from microlensing because of these wave effects and because of other effects uh, were actually much laxer than what uh, was originally thought. And so those black holes actually can be 100% of the dark matter. What I'm going to talk about today is another instance of the smallness of black holes uh, sort of interplaying with quantum effects. Uh, and in this particular case, what I'm interested in is the possibility that dark matter particles collapse at the center of neutron stars. And I'll explain how this can happen in quite some detail today. Uh, and if they collapse into a black hole, this black hole could then swallow the neutrons that make up the neutron star and destroy the neutron star. Therefore, the observation of neutron stars in dark matter rich environments like our own galaxy that does have hundreds and thousands of, of neutron stars, this proves the possibility that you can accrete dark matter inside neutron stars. And so sets important constraints for particle dark matter models. What we realized is that in many particle physics models for the dark matter, the black hole that forms inside neutron stars is actually smaller than the neutrons themselves. What do I mean by that? Well, of course, when I talk about the size of a neutron, I'm thinking about the de Broglie wavelength uh, of the neutron as a quantum particle. So that de Broglie wavelength is bigger than the size of the black hole. So, you know, neutrons are gonna have a hard time falling inside a black hole that is smaller than their quantum size. Uh, and so this observation prompted us to understanding the problem of neutron star quantum death by small black holes, where again, small means the Schwarzschild radius is smaller than the de Broglie wavelength of the baryons that make up neutron stars. So let me start by uh, telling you something that you all know, which is that most particle models uh, explain the origin of the dark matter cosmologically as the result of a freeze out process, meaning that uh, the dark matter, uh, if it shares some interaction with the standard model uh, uh, particle content, it might have been in thermal equilibrium with standard model particles in the early universe. And then if it fell out of equilibrium and if these interactions and the mass of the particle were around the electroweak scale, then the thermal relic abundance is about right, and the particle uh, is also sufficiently cold from the standpoint of, of structural formation. 
So, so this idea of freeze out, so of a moment where particles number density no longer follow uh, the equilibrium distribution uh, dictated by the temperature of the universe uh, at some point in time is one possible mechanism to explain why there is the amount of dark matter that there is in the universe. And in addition, if freeze out indeed is the mechanism that sets the abundance of the dark matter, then there should be in the late universe, some relic annihilation of dark matter wherever there's a large enough density of dark matter. And this you know, allows and enables one to search for dark matter today. Uh, because let's say, you know, you look at the center of the galaxy, uh, we know there's a lot of dark matter there. So there should be a lot of pair annihilation. And so if you pick a particle that might result in the pair annihilation of the dark matter, such as the photon or neutrinos, then you can try to look for those particles directly in the center of the galaxy. Uh, even if particles don't travel directly to you, uh, such as positron or antiprotons, uh, dark matter annihilation can produce those particles that then trickle through diffusion all the way to you in the galaxy. Uh, and so there are a variety of ways to search for dark matter today by using the fact that annihilation is a necessary ingredient for freeze out. Uh, and so, you know, many people, including myself, have made a career out of thinking about ways to look for the dark matter. And in fact, this guy uh, that I know quite well, has written an entire book where uh, a large fraction of it is devoted to the notion that, you know, we can perhaps look for the debris of particle annihilation because the genesis of dark matter has to do with freeze out. By the way, highly recommended book. Uh, however, however, there's no example other than neutrinos, neutrinos do freeze out, uh, that pertains to our visible sector in some sense. So the baryonic matter was not born uh, as a result of freeze out. In fact, a, an instructive exercise is to calculate uh, what the freeze out abundance of baryons and antibaryons is. And, and you know, it's, it's smaller than the observed amount of baryons by about 10 orders of magnitude. So that's, that's an interesting uh, little exercise. Uh, so the reason why there is more matter than antimatter has not to do with the freeze out mechanism, but rather because of some process or some initial condition that set up an asymmetry between the matter and the antimatter sector of, um, of our universe. Now, uh, many people for many years, in fact, several decades have thought that this is a perfectly plausible explanation for the genesis of dark matter as well. So if the dark matter is not its own antiparticle, if there is a dark matter and an anti-dark matter, then uh, an asymmetry in the dark sector could also explain the abundance of, uh, of the dark matter today under certain circumstances. And in particular, one can make predictions. So for instance, if there is uh, you know, a, a, a link between the visible and the dark sector asymmetry, then you can argue that the dark matter mass must have certain values depending on model assumptions. And there's been quite a bit of, uh, of work in this direction as well. So if, if in fact the dark matter genesis has to do with an asymmetry, then there's no reason why we should expect a visible signal from dark matter. Dark matter can be completely fine by not talking at all with the visible sector. Uh, however, an interaction is not ruled out either. So there might be uh, some non-zero scattering cross-section between uh, an asymmetric dark matter and ordinary matter. Uh, if that's the case, if that's the case, then it is interesting to note that you might look for asymmetric dark matter by the usual story, by direct detection experiments. So these are large uh, underground targets shielded from uh, cosmic radiation that seek to 
uh, find the tiny energy deposition that galactic dark matter would impart uh, under the assumption that there is this scattering cross-section of ordinary matter from dark matter onto ordinary matter. Uh, however, it turns out that a much better set of constraints uh, emerges from the fact that if the dark matter is asymmetric and if the dark matter interacts a little bit with ordinary matter, then it triggers the destruction of neutron stars. And the reason is that unlike, unlike, unlike WIMP models of dark matter where the dark matter perannihilates, uh, if the dark matter is asymmetric, it cannot perannihilate. And therefore it keeps accreting into neutron stars up until the point where a black hole can form and can destroy uh, neutron stars. Uh, and in fact, as I'll explain shortly um, uh, in a few minutes, these cross sections needed to accumulate enough dark matter to form a black hole uh, are much smaller than the cross sections needed uh, to directly detect dark matter. So the process of capture of dark matter in celestial bodies is very well known. Uh, it's been studied for many years. It's, it's known in quite some detail. Uh, and again, if the dark matter cannot pair annihilate, it will accrete over time, possibly thermalize, possibly, and I'll get back to this, form a Bose-Einstein condensate, and possibly eventually collapsing into a black hole which again can destroy neutron stars. So the very existence of old neutron stars, and here for reference, the age, the typical age of a neutron star is about 10 uh, billion years. In dark matter rich regions, constraints asymmetric or non-annihilating dark matter. So this is not the only possibility uh, to form a black hole in the center of a neutron star by accreting exotic matter. In fact, there are examples of macroscopic dark matter candidates. For instance, uh, the strangelets that were envisioned a few years back and that are completely fine dark matter candidates um, could have a large scattering cross-section with, uh, with neutron stars and therefore could accrete and could also uh, lead to the formation of black holes inside neutron stars. So before discussing how these black holes form from dark matter accretion, let me note a point that I was making at the beginning of my talk. What if the black hole size, so its Schwarzschild radius, is smaller than the size of the neutron star constituents? So what if the de Broglie wavelength of neutrons is larger than the size of black hole? The main point that we noted was that in the literature, the description of matter accretion onto uh, black holes instead of neutron stars uh, was always in the language of classical fluid dynamics, meaning that the key assumption was that the accreting particles were massless point particles. All right. Uh, instead, if you want to describe what happens to a quantum particle in falling onto a black hole, really what you ought to do is use the language of quantum mechanics and think about the scattering of a particle in a Schwarzschild metric or in whatever metric your black hole uh, uh, you know, forms inside the neutron star. Uh, and, so, and so this was the problem that uh, we want to deal with as long as this is an interesting regime. So the real question here is, do we care about these small black holes? So how big is the black hole that forms inside a neutron star that accretes dark matter? So first of all, you need to accrete enough dark matter particles. And second of all, and second of all, to trigger gravitational collapse, as Chandra Sekhar taught us many decades ago, uh, the simple one ingredient is that gravitational pressure ought to win against the generosity pressure. So the energy associated 
with self-gravitating particles uh, has to be larger than the quantum pressure or the generative pressure uh, that the particles have because of their quantum mechanical nature. So let me first talk about the number of accreted particles that we expect in a uh, neutron star. So in theory, this is a quite complicated process where one has to think about the capture in terms of momentum loss as dark matter particles scatter off of particles inside the neutron star, passage after passage. So the orbit shrinks because you deposit momentum onto the neutron star till eventually gets confined inside the neutron star. It can thermalize inside the neutron star and, and eventually it, it forms a self-gravitating uh, system. So the question is how large should the cross-section be? And it's easy to realize that there is a critical cross-section beyond which you cannot do better. Uh, and that critical cross-section corresponds to the cross-section such that the mean free path inside the neutron star is exactly the same size as the neutron star, uh, which in other words means that if you cross the neutron star, you scatter on average, all right? Uh, so let me just remind you that the mean free path uh, of a particle is defined as the inverse product of the cross section times the number density of target particles. So here this sigma is the cross section that I've been talking about. So the cross section between dark matter and ordinary matter, let's say neutrons. Uh, and n sub n is the number density of neutrons inside the neutron star. So that's the ratio of the physical density rho to the mass of the neutron. And I'm simplifying here uh, a neutron star as being actually made up of neutrons, which is actually not so clear. So the density itself is just the mass divided by the volume of the neutron star. So again, M here is the mass of the neutron star. R is the radius of the neutron star, which let me just remind you, uh, this is about 1.4 uh, or one solar mass thereabout. R is about tens of kilometers. Uh, so these are very high densities. Uh, and so when you ask the lambda be equal to R, so that on average, you always scatter with the neutron star as the dark matter flies through, you get this critical cross section, 10 to the negative 45 centimeters squared, which is much, much smaller than the cross section that, um, that you can hope to uh, have in a you know, direct detection experiment. So there are a few subtleties in this calculation. And one subtlety has to do with uh, a simple statistical mechanics fact, which is that neutrons inside the neutron star are basically at the general Fermi gas. And so their momentum distribution is sort of saturated uh, and all momenta between zero and the Fermi momentum in absolute value are all populated 100%. Uh, of course, the neutron star has some small temperature, so that is not an exact statement. So there's a small deviation. So it's not exactly a step function. You have a little bit of a rounding effect, as, as we will remember. I had, from... a, I had a question. Yes, go ahead. Previous estimate, your mean free path estimate. Yes. Can you go back to that slide, please, if you don't mind? Yep. There we go. Yeah. You have this formula one by sigma times density, number density, which is a non relativistic kinetic theory. But I guess you have to treat everything as ultra relativistic. Does this translate in this way, or are there major corrections? Thank you very much. So, this is just a very simplified version of the actual critical cross section. Uh, so don't take it too seriously. It's just you know, an illustration of what the order of magnitude is. And you're absolutely correct. In fact, you can see here the Fermi momentum is 0.2 GB. So you know, particles are close to relativistic. The dark matter is slow in the galaxy. 
Okay, its speed is about 10 to the negative three natural units. Uh, so after all, take it in other relativistic, simple-minded limit is not such a bad approximation, but in the actual calculation that people use to find the critical cross-section for capture, uh, relativistic effects are in fact taken into account. So it's just a, a slight oversimplification, uh, if you will allow me. So let, let's go back to, uh, to the issue of the Fermi momentum. Now, if the momentum transfer to the neutron is larger than the Fermi momentum, then this is totally fine because the scattered neutrons are excited above the Fermi surface. On the other hand, if the momentum transfer delta P is less than the Fermi momentum, then you have a reduced target of neutrons that can participate in the capture process. Uh, and in fact, you get a suppression that is of the order of delta P, where delta P is the momentum transfer of the dark matter uh, to the neutrons divided by the Fermi momentum. So when is that relevant? Well, that's relevant when delta P is small, when delta P is smaller than 0.2 GV. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, you know, we have to, to find out what the typical velocity of a dark matter particle uh, that will be accreted onto a neutron star is, and that's uh, you know of the order uh, or smaller than the escape velocity for a neutron star. And so this is the suppression factor. And so if you put in the numbers, you get that this effect of sort of quantum suppression of the capture happens only for sort of light dark matter candidates, so for, for masses below about 1 GeV. So for masses for which there's no uh, hindering, quantum hindering of the capture process, the, and again, here instead, uh, I'm doing things uh, in, in full detail. So when you, when you do things fully relativistically and uh, when you account uh, for all the relevant effects, it turns out that the number of accreted particles uh, over the lifetime of a neutron stars is on this order. And of course, it decreases, it decreases with the mass of the particle. And the simple reason for that is that the flux, the impinging flux of dark matter particles uh, is, is given by the dark matter velocity times its number density, uh, which in turn is the, again, physical density divided by the mass. So uh, the heavier the particles, the fewer particles to accrete. Uh, and this sigma xp is the smallest between the actual cross-section and the maximum possible cross-section. Okay, so once again, you cannot do better than the critical cross-section that I was mentioning before, which is, again, when you put in all relativistic effects is about 2.1 times 10 to the negative 45 centimeters squared. If, on the other hand, there is uh, a hindering process to the capture, of dark matter in the neutron star, then this dependence on the mass drops away and you actually don't accrete arbitrarily many light dark matter particles because of this uh, Fermi sphere uh, effect that I was mentioning. So this is the total number of particles that you accrete. Uh, however, what we're interested in is what is the mass of the black hole that forms if you accrete enough particles. So the critical number of particles that triggers gravitational collapse obviously depends on whether the particle is a boson or a fermion, so on the spin of the dark matter. In the case of fermions, uh, of course, the gravitational collapse occurs, and this is the just simplified version of the classic Chandrasekhar argument, when Pauli blocking uh, no longer prevents gravitational collapse. So this is the gravitational uh, sort of energy associated with, um, with a particle in a self-gravitating sphere of radius r. And so when you demand this condition, interestingly enough, the radius drops off and you have a sharp prediction for the critical number of fermions that collapse into a black hole. And it is a beautiful, simple expression that just depends on the ratio of the Planck scale to the mass of the dark matter particle. So now notice that the Planck scale enters just because I'm recasting G as one over M Planck squared, of course. Um, 
And so the mass of the resulting black hole in the fermionic case is just the product of this NF times the mass of the particle. Um, and uh, when the dust settles, this is actually cubed here. When the dust settles, you have something on the order of nine times 10 to the 30 for a one GV particle. Of course, collapse can only happen can only happen as long as you accrete enough particles. Okay, so as long as you have this number, Nx, that depends on where your neutron star is, that depends on the cross section and depends on the age of the neutron star. If that Nx is larger than this number, then, uh, then you have collapse into a black hole at the center of the neutron star. Very good. So in the case of bosons, uh, the calculation is slightly different. The calculation is different because, of course, there's no Pauli blocking. There's just a zero-point energy of, uh, of uh, free boson. Uh, and here I'm assuming that there's no condensation into a BEC, into a Bose-Einstein condensate. Uh, and again, uh, R drops out, and the number of bosonic particles that cannot uh, resist gravitational collapse is given by a slightly different power of the ratio of the Planck scale to the mass of the particle. And this is the predicted black hole mass in the absence of formation of a Bose-Einstein condensate. And we'll get back to that, but obviously that depends on the temperature of uh, the neutron star with respect to the critical temperature of the condensate. Uh, and again, collapse only happened as long as enough particles are accreted. But this, once again, is a weak condition, is a condition that goes well beyond, in terms of cross-section, what can be tested with direct detection. So let's look at what we found so far in this sort of simple-minded rehashing of Chandra Sekar's classic arguments. So if this is your dark matter particle mass in GeV, this is the predicted black hole mass. Again, I'm neglecting Bose-Einstein condensation, uh, and this is the case of fermions. So if you have sort of a weak scale boson, you expect a black hole mass in this range. Now, what is this red line? Well, this red line is the name of the game. This red line is the line at which the black hole is small, okay? This red line tells you that uh, you have to include quantum scattering effects onto the black hole. You cannot use fluid dynamics, okay? Neutrons are too big to get uh, sunk into the black hole, okay? And here, uh, to just, you know, define a little bit more quantitatively what I mean, uh, this is, of course, the expression in natural units of the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, the condition is Schwarzschild radius equals the de Broglie wavelength of uh, a neutron inside a neutron star, so two pi natural units divided by the Fermi momentum. So this define an UNRU mass, and I'm calling it UNRU for reasons that will become soon clear, that is a few times 10 to the 12 kilograms. And we get back to what this green line is, uh, but I'm sure that many in the audience already uh, can imagine what the green line is. Uh, black holes evaporate, and so the black hole that forms inside the neutron star is too light, it just vanishes, it just evaporates away. But this green line corresponds roughly to that uh, critical evaporation mass. So neutrons anywhere here are bigger than the black hole. And this is uh, why uh, we thought it was, it was really important uh, to think about uh, this particular case. So, in the entire scientific literature before our work, uh, the description of neutron accretion onto black holes was done in the very simple picture uh, that is the Bondi Hoyle picture. So some of you might remember a, a classical mechanics problem where you have uh, you know, a star that moves through dust and the star has a velocity V and a mass M uh, and the dust has density rho. And uh, you're asked to calculate what is the accreted amount of dust that the star collects as it plows through, as it plows through the dust. 
Uh, and in fact, you might remember that there is uh, this interesting and, and very easy to calculate gravitational focusing effect that it slightly increases the geometric cross-section that might, one might otherwise um, uh, guess as uh, so the order of magnitude of uh, the accretion rate. So this zeta HL is the hoyle littleton radius, uh, which again is just the geometric cross-section including uh, including the gravitational focusing effect. Now, what Bondi oil does is it generates, it, it generalizes uh, the hoyle littleton result, uh, including fluid effects. And so there's this, uh, this fluid coefficient lambda s that depends on the equational state of the fluid that you're accreting. So pressure is function of density and uh, has also a dependence on the sound speed Inside, uh, inside the fluid. So this has been the uh, accretion that was used in the literature uh, all the way up until our work. So in the limit in which you can use Bondi, uh, particles are by construction, by construction, massless and point light. All right, so clearly when the Schwarzschild radius is too small, uh, particles cannot be considered massless and certainly cannot be considered point-like. They possess a quantum wavelength uh, and the problem becomes a simple quantum mechanical scattering problem that we were very happy to realize was solved completely in the regime of interest to us uh, by uh, a famous Canadian physicist by the name of Undru in 1976. So that was really good news. All we needed to use was Unruh's cross-section, hence Unruh's mass uh, in a couple of slides ago. Uh, and so the rate of so neutron accretion. Can you explain this? Can I ask a question about the previous slide? Yes. So in, even in the, this classical regime, in this boundary oil accretion, so suppose initially black hole is at the center of the star, and then it is accreting particles. I would assume that these particles will give it some momentum as it accretes, so it may, may make some random motion. Uh, so is there a possibility that, you know, this might accumulate and it, black hole might be kicked out of the neutron star? Good question. Um, I would say no. And the reason is that these black holes have to be massive, not to quickly evaporate away. Uh, we're massive means about 10 to the 12 kilograms. Uh, and neutrons inside a neutron star are fairly slow, okay? Their momentum, again, is at most on the order of the Fermi momentum, which is 0.2 GeV. So uh, certainly, you know, somebody is, 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 is writing in the chat, random thermal motion gives a, a, a net velocity equal to zero, which is certainly going to be the case. As a net, uh, as a net result, but you know, what is the effect then? The effect is a slight change in the relative velocity between the black hole and the accreting neutrons. So I suspect that this, um, you know, that this would not really change the picture. But thanks for the question. Yeah, so even if on average, okay, you know, the net momentum is zero, but you would imagine that. Uh, a small uh, asymmetry might amplify and, you know, but okay, but I, I guess you're... Yeah, there might be some jittering, but again, I, I suspect that uh, that is certainly not enough to Another sort of kick the that. black hole out, to kick the black hole out of the neutron star. Uh, and also yeah. the neutron stars are usually spinning, so which means that the neutrons inside have angular momentum. Very good. That so that, that effect has been studied in the context of the Bondi picture. That effect has been studied in the context of the Bondi picture uh, and, and is well known. Uh, and again, there's very, very mild changes to this form uh, for the Bondi accretion, which of course in this case is, uh, is spherical symmetric and, and you lose spherical symmetry in the case of a spinning neutron star. But that is well known It's a calculation that Kuvaris and uh, collaborators have carried out a few years back. Okay. So in the, in the quantum case, the overall cross-section has this structure, has this structure. So it depends on the mass 
of the hole on the mass of the particle and on the relative velocity. Um, so this is a non-relativistic calculation. Um, and the validity of this calculation, once again, is where this ratio is much smaller than one. Okay, so it, it, it all depends on this combination of, um, of the mass parameters and the velocity between the particles. Uh, so what is, at the end of the day, the amount of mass per unit time that gets accreted? Well, it's just the integral of that cross-section that, again, depends on velocity over the velocity distribution, which is known uh, for neutrons. And again, if you want to include the jittering effect of a black hole in a thermal environment, you can do that. Uh, but you know this, this is the result. So there is a nagging problem, however. And the problem is that UNRU's calculation assumes that you're tossing plane waves onto the black hole. So that your asymptotic state is you know, what we all like to see in a, in a quantum calculation as the asymptotic state. It's a plane wave. Uh, now, is that a good assumption instead of UNRU's star? Certainly not. OK, uh, but the key question is, am I limited in the accretion onto the black hole by the number of neutrons that I can feed to the black hole? Uh, and so this question boils down to calculating at which rate neutrons get bounced around and can arrive, can arrive to the black hole to be swallowed by it. Uh, so the assumption of an infinite reservoir of neutrons corresponds to the assumption that this rate that we're looking at, the UNRU rate, uh, be uh, uh, you know, uh, slower than the rate at which I can feed neutrons uh, onto the black hole. And that rate in terms of mass accretion is just the neutron-neutron scattering cross-section, which is on the order of one barn, uh, average over velocity times the neutron uh, physical density, okay? So for larger black hole masses, what happens is that you're still concerned about feeding neutrons onto the black hole, but it, as the black hole becomes bigger and bigger, you, you're fine using the classical picture and the feeding of the neutrons becomes, uh, you know, gets taken into account by the bondi hoyle picture that imposes momentum and energy conservation. And at the same time, uh, as the bondi hoyle picture is valid, we will see that the hole is in fact large enough uh, for, for wave effects to be neglected. So uh, we, we give this formula that is seemingly a little bit, uh, a little bit complicated, but in fact, once you look at, this, at the next slide, you'll understand perfectly what this formula means. Uh, and so the accretion of mass onto the black hole is the smallest between the rate at which I feed neutrons to the black hole, that is this gray line, and the UNRU rate, okay, all the way up until when I am limited by my ability to feed neutrons onto the black hole, at which point the UNRU rate is saturated is saturated by, again, the scattering of neutrons that feeds neutrons onto the black hole. And eventually, only around these masses does the Bondi oil picture set in. And as it turns out, and this is a statement I was making one slide ago, for this black hole mass, neutrons are already in the Bondi regime. And so you can safely follow uh, the Bondi rate. Now, there is another line on my plot. There is a blue line that represents the other key feature of light black hole, which is Hawking evaporation. So black hole masses change because of uh, this very well-known semi-classical process uh, known as Hawking evaporation, where pair production of particles near the event horizon allows for mass losses. And, uh, and this is, again, a very well-known process that depends intrinsically on the black hole temperature, uh, which in turn feeds a dependence on the number of degrees of freedom available to black hole evaporation. This is described by this function f of m. And you can see the kinks here 
in the Hawking line that follow the fact that as the black hole becomes less and less massive, its temperature increases because the temperature, remember, uh, is the Planck scale square divided by the black hole mass. So the temperature increases inversely proportionally to the black hole mass. And so as I go back, the arcing evaporation becomes increasingly efficient because I have more and more degrees of freedom to evaporate to. Um, but what is critical, what is critical is that there will be a point at which accretion and evaporation compensate each other. There is a critical mass at which accretion and evaporation compensate each other. And this is perhaps one of the most critical findings of our study, because as you can see here, this critical mass falls inside the UND regime and it's well outside where the Bondi regime is applicable. Uh, so this sets an absolute uh, lower limit to the mass of black holes that accrete as opposed to evaporate into nothing inside neutron stars. So the evaporation time scale for masses below and critical is very quick. Okay, so it's on the order at most uh, 10 to the 12 seconds. That's 10 to the five years. So it's, you know, about a millionth time shorter than the life of a neutron star. So like black holes, if you don't accrete enough dark matter particles, or if your particle model uh, tells you that the mass of the black hole is too light, then you evaporate very quickly. So this kind of prompted us to the question, well, so what? Can we hope to see these black hole sudden evaporations of dark matter accreted uh, uh, black holes? Well, we don't think so, but we're not sure. Uh, so let me rephrase the critical mass in terms of ergs. So that's about 10 to the 35 ergs. Now, is that a large amount of total possible energy deposited inside a neutron star or not? You know, if you look at how neutron stars are observed in real life, they're observed by X-ray telescopes, right? They shine in X-rays because their temperature is in the uh, keV. Uh, and so observations of the temperature of the neutron star are possible. So you might hope that an explosion of a black hole inside a neutron star would warm up the neutron star enough that you would notice that increase in temperature. But unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, my friends who are experts on neutron stars, uh, Sanjay Gupta is one of them, uh, tell me that the specific heat of a neutron star is in fact very, very large. And so, you know, probably a 10 to the 35 ergs energy deposition would not move by more than a fraction of a degree Kelvin, the temperature of a neutron star. And that's well below uh, any X-ray sensitivity. Uh, so the deposited heat would never yield a detectable temperature change to the neutron star. So that's unfortunate. However, I somehow dream that this Hawking evaporation process inside a neutron star might actually have observable effects. So one of the things that we don't quite understand about pulsars is that every so often their period of rotation uh, suddenly changes. The frequency of rotation suddenly changes. These are known as glitches. They're observed uh, sort of it's a prosaic observation in radio. They've been observed in gamma rays recently, the Fermi telescope. And it's very interesting because it's unknown what triggers these sudden changes in the rotation period of a neutron star. It seems like the most plausible explanation is that the glitches are, are fed by star quakes. So there's a sudden change in the shape of the neutron star uh, that changes the moment of inertia of the star and therefore causes the glitch. So maybe, maybe these exploding black holes might actually cause the glitches. So they don't have enough energy uh, to be the glitches, but they could sort of rupture the neutron star enough. So that's all fantasy. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think if somebody wanted to study this, uh, it would be quite interesting to follow up. So Stefano, uh, yes. I have a quick question. So what is the time scale of evaporation? I, did you say anything about that? Because the glitches yes. are very fast. Uh, so. Yes. So uh, very good question. Thank you, uh, Ashwin. So the time scale for evaporation is very quick. 
uh, let's see if I have here uh, numbers. Well, this is the total evaporation time, but most of the energy is actually dumped uh, towards the end. So the end, you know, this is a runaway process. So uh, I think that probably, um, you know, the time scales would not be totally unreasonable to be matched with the glitch time scales. Because again, it's a runaway process. So it ends all of a sudden. Um, so despite the fact that this is a long time scale, uh, at least for 10 to the 10 kilograms, uh, you know, for either light black holes or in general for, for when most of the mass of the black hole is, uh, is burnt out, I think the process is quite fast. But that's a very good question. So we also looked into neutrinos. Uh, neutrinos, uh, you know, neutron stars are very dense. So they're opaque to neutrinos up to very high energies. And so there's uh, up to very low energies where there's no hope uh, to see a signal above uh, the atmospheric neutrino background. So there doesn't seem to be a hope, unlike what happens to dark matter annihilation, the earth or in the sun uh, to see uh, the effect of this, uh, of this evaporation process. So we then calculated obviously the lifetime of the black holes with a mass uh, above, so the, the, the lifetime of the neutron star for black holes above the critical mass. Uh, and interestingly enough, in units of the typical neutron star age, this is a very, very short lifetime, even in the UNDRU uh, correct uh, picture. Uh, and so, you know, if you do form a black hole that is, uh, that is above the critical mass, the neutron star is gone. Okay, and that is similar to what the literature incorrectly had uh, for the bondi hoyle accretion. Uh, so in general, uh, we find that in the UNRU regime or in the Bondi regime, the neutron star destruction time is always shorter than the neutron star, star lifetime. So let me now, uh, before concluding, go back uh, a little bit uh, to the particle physics uh, predictions in greater detail of the black hole mass uh, seeded by dark matter. Uh, so in the case of fermions, the calculation that sort of mimicked what Chandrasekhar um, uh, did in the case of baryonic matter is pretty much correct. However, in the bosonic case, uh, there are two important effects. One is self-interactions uh, that generally uh, you know, can strongly affect uh, the energy of a ball of radius R of bosons uh, through this term, all right? And then, uh, of course, you've got uh, Bose-Einstein condensation. Okay, so let me first discuss the case of self-interactions. So for self-interactions, what we find, and this is also sort of a new calculation that we have in our paper, what we find is that actually for very strongly self-interacting bosons, bosons behave like, form, like fermions. Okay, so the number, the critical number of bosons that collapse into a black hole goes like one over the mass of the boson cubed, which is exactly the fermionic behavior. So that's quite interesting. Uh, and so similarly for the mass of the black hole. In the case of Bose-Einstein condensation, things are even more interesting because you really tend to form very small black holes. Okay, if you form a condensate. Uh, so a condensate, let me, let me remind you, forms if the critical temperature of uh, the Bose gas um, is comparable with, in this case, the core temperature of the star, so with the environmental temperature. Uh, and so the number of particles that collapses into a condensate is then given by this function that is well known. And here the thermalization radius can be estimated uh, by this uh, expression that depends on the mass of the particle on the mass of the boson and on the core temperature of the neutron star, which as we will see is about a million Kelvin degrees or you know, a few keV. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, what you have for the case of a Bose-Einstein condensate is that if it forms, if it forms, uh, it is the condensate that drives the formation uh, of a black hole. So the prediction for the mass of the black hole is significantly smaller uh, than in the absence of the condensate. Now, let me, let me get to my last uh, plot for today. I, I never liked talks with many plots. I think today I showed you two plots. So this is the second and last plot. Uh, in this plot, I show uh, sort of an update 
uh, to the, the one plus. So this is kind of one B figure uh, that I showed earlier. So this is the fermionic line, which again, even if there are some self interactions is essentially fine. Uh, in the case of bosons, again, the formation of a condensate depends critically on uh, the core temperature, which is some uh, number of order one times 10 to the six. Uh, and so I show you what the mass here of the black hole that you form is as soon as the mass of the dark matter is small enough for condensate uh, to form in the case of a constant, a constant self-interaction of this order of magnitude. So again, you have the case where self-interactions dominate and then you condensate you have a condensate that drives the formation of black hole. So you lose memory of the particle mass. Uh, and then here, uh, again, uh, you, you follow the condensate as opposed to the line that would correspond uh, to the standard bosonic one over m squared mass of the black hole. So in this plot, I have these shaded regions that reflect where our work is important. So our work is important uh, because it sets the correct critical mass below which the black hole explodes. So this is now the state of the art value for the critical mass below which there's no neutron star disruption because you have a black hole explosion inside a neutron star. This is a relatively narrow regime where uh, the UNRU scattering cross-section of absorption of fermions onto a black hole applies and you feed enough neutrons. In this green regime, you're limited by feeding enough neutrons uh, to saturate UNRU. And finally, in the white region, Bondi applies. So depending on your particle physics model, and here we have a different set of curves for a few quantum gravity uh, motivated uh, bosonic self-interaction models. Uh, depending on your particle physics model, and again, you know, many, many uh, models of the electro scale will follow here, you have to use the quantum cross-section. So let me now conclude. So what I talked about today is the notion that when the quantum size of neutrons exceeds the Schulze radius of the black hole at a center neutron star, then accretion is no longer classical. You have to give up on fluid dynamics and on the bondi hoyle picture, and you have to describe the accretion as a quantum mechanical process. Uh, so we, we carried out this exercise uh, and we argued that that is key in calculating the critical mass at which uh, accretion wins over evaporation. And that's actually slightly lower than what you get in the Bondi picture. Uh, uh, however, we also found, and this is the reassuring part of our result, that even in the UNRU picture, the accretion is actually more efficient than the Bondi accretion. And so neutron stars continue to be uh, uh, faded to die by quantum effects as well as by fluid dynamic effects. So I think there, there are a bunch of interesting open questions. Uh, one, of course, the big elephant in the room is we are dealing with a set of fermions at finite temperature and finite chemical potential. And I've said nothing about it. I've described the accretion process as free particles being dumped onto an isolated black hole. So that's the first approximation. It's not the correct approximation. Uh, another thing that I sort of uh, did not go into any detail on because we haven't worked on it yet is what happens between UNRU and Bondi. Okay, what happens there? I've just said that you need to feed neutrons, uh, but that's not the only thing that happens. You have a crossover of wave effects. And so that's another interesting calculation. So the calculation of... Uh, how the UNRU cross-section changes as the size of the black hole grows beyond uh, the De Bruyne wavelength of the neutrons. Uh, and, and finally, uh, again, the, the accreting neutrons are not plane waves. Uh, so the way they are fed onto the, onto the black hole uh, depends on scattering processes and on the outcome of scattering processes. So they're not plane waves. And finally, uh, on a more fundamental logical note, is there any hope to detect a black hole explosion inside a neutron star? Uh, and what about, you know, similar black holes that might form inside other celestial bodies? Uh, do they form? And if so, is there any way to detect Hawking evaporation of light black holes seeded by dark matter accretion? And I'm going to stop here. Thank you.
Thanks, Stefano. Uh, so, uh, any questions? So, Dibya has a question. Go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, so, I was just wondering that, uh, so basically, um, you know, what Rishi had earlier asked about this black hole being uh, knocked out of the star uh, by some Brownian motion sort of an effect. Uh, even if we are in a co-rotating dark matter halo, uh, we will have some sort of velocity difference between the star that is uh, rotating around the galaxy and the background uh, dark matter pool, no? So can, yes. the, can the accretion of such dark matters with a velocity gradient in a particular direction knock out this uh, black hole being formed inside the neutron star? Uh, thank you very much, Stevie. This is a very good question. So a couple of parts to your question. So number one, uh, you know, once you accrete enough dark matter particles, all of a sudden you form a black hole and, uh, and, and that's it. From then on, you don't care about dark matter because the accretion rate of dark matter is much, much slower than the accretion rate of neutrons. Okay, so after a black hole forms, uh, after a black hole forms, dark matter accretion becomes entirely irrelevant. All right, so that's part number one. Part number two is, uh, however, quite interesting. And so you're asking, well, wait a second, when you showed us the way in which you calculated uh, your accreted uh, accretion rate, which I'm trying to find my slide, here we go. So I'm just gonna share the slide right here. Uh, so you see, Divya, in, in this formula, uh, I'm sort of integrating kind of naively. Actually, let, let me go back to a different formula. Let's see. So in this formula here, rather, uh, you know, implicitly there is a velocity distribution for the dark matter particles. Now you're saying, well, in fact, pulsars are known to have very large velocities in the galaxy. In fact, that's an observational problem in you know, these large pulsar kicks. So are we sure that this number is calculated using the correct velocity distribution, the relative velocity distribution between a pulsar that might have a very high velocity and the sea of dark matter particles? You right. see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think uh, that might not have been calculated. I, I'm fairly sure that this number here is derived using a standard Maxwellian velocity truncated in the escape velocity of the galaxy. Uh, so I, I bet this would be an interesting calculation to carry out. Okay. And just uh, one more, I think, just to clear my understanding is um, if the black hole spins, then it can be made more stable, right? Uh, you might even... I don't think so. Okay. Uh, why do you say that? Uh, you're, you're saying that black hole evaporation is slowed down by spin? If I recall correctly, yes, I'm not sure. Actually, I think it's the opposite because when a black hole has no spin, it has a very hard time evaporating into particles with a spin. Okay, okay, then I'll have to, yeah. And so, yeah, and so I think the gray body factor for a rotating black hole is bigger than for a stationary black hole. So I think actually in the case of a rotating black hole, um, you would evaporate more efficiently. So that the critical okay. mass would be slightly larger. Yes. Okay. But that's a good Understood. question. Yeah. yeah. Hi, DJ. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You're coming through very faintly if you can, if you can speak up if possible. Is it better? Uh, slightly better. Go ahead. Um, is the lifetime of neutron is anyway relevant here? Because when it's getting fitted, it is as a neutron star or is an individual particle? So you're asking, is the neutron lifetime a relevant time scaling the problem? Yeah. Uh, and it is not. It is not. Uh, so processes inside neutron stars maintain neutrons, uh, you know, they, they, they feed neutrons continually. So the, the reverse, the inverse decay is, is a very efficient process in other words. So, um, you know, in just the same way that neutron neutron scattering is much faster inside a neutron star than, um, 
than uh, uh, neutron decay, so is inverse neutron decay. And uh, what type of scattering, um, what are the interactions that happen for the speeding? And what is the interaction type? Yeah, this is just QCD. So of course, I, I'm not an expert on, uh, on high density QCD. And there are a, a series of very interesting open questions um, that, you know, uh, I'm the wrong person to uh, to ask, uh, but you know these are because these uh, uh, decay time may be relevant at some point of time. Uh, neutron decay time. That's why I'm asking what type of interaction is happening. Yeah, again, this this you know at a fundamental level, this is just QCD uh, at finite temperature and finite pressure. Uh, so the interactions are just you know gluons. Okay. If there are no further questions, I have one. So I missed one point about. Oh, Vasil has a question. So let me complete it then. Uh, I had I missed the link between your first plot and the second plot. You said that in the case that you form a, a BEC, the size mm -hmm. of the black hole is uh, smaller, and then that's I would, right. Uh, imagine in that case the uh, the UNRU regime will be wider compared to the uh, uh, bonded regime just because uh, that's effects are more important. It seemed like opposite to me from the plot. Uh, so so this is the so this is the prediction the naive prediction okay, okay. that I that I carried out here mm -hmm. where you see that you know the the mass of the black hole is inversely proportional to the mass of the dark matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you just grow and grow. The reality, the reality, however, is this. Okay, so as soon as you form a condensate, uh, the mass of black hole drops. Oh, okay, I see. I see. And depending on the self-interaction, you, uh, you have other effects, but this is what I'm talking about. Instead of being here, you see this dashed line, uh, Rashmi? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so instead of being here, you're, you know, five orders of magnitude down below. Okay. Okay, thanks. And uh, then Basila had a, had a question. Yep. Yeah. Hi, Stefan, a very nice talk. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. I had a, uh, I mean, not really a question, but maybe we, we could discuss a bit. Uh, so this issue has worried me a bit, as in, like, dark matter accretes onto this uh, neutron star. And this infalling dark matter would typically have some angular momentum. Mm -hmm. Normally, when this happens, stuff settles into uh, you know, an orbit of finite radius. It doesn't fall in at r equal to zero. There's a centrifugal barrier. Uh, you understand that in this case, perhaps stuff keeps coalescing towards the center because of the equation of state being very stiff and there being some dissipation? Uh, you know, but I think the answer is, is easier. So this is, not, this is not an elastic process, right? So uh, the dark matter interacts inelastically with, uh, um, with the neutron star. It deposits energy and so orbits shrink and angular momentum is shed. So, you know, Generally, if you have a, a probability of order one to interact with the matter in the neutron star, you shed both energy and angular momentum. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the assumption that the dark matter in a finite amount of time collapses to the center or thermalizes uh, is, is generally correct. And this would also be true in the UNRU regime? This does not depend on the black hole mass. Yeah. Okay, I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay, I don't see any more questions. So thanks once again for a very nice talk and uh, thanks for waking up till so late uh, and giving this talk and uh, hope My to pleasure. see you in person sometime soon. I very much hope so. Okay. All the best to everyone. And, and indeed, I hope to see you soon. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very Thanks. much.